budget battle, President Obama sends Congress a record proposal that would boost taxes on higher income Americans and corporations. Traveling Pontiff, Pope Francis says he'll visit Sarajevo to foster brotherhood in a country still healing from war. Super Bowl Sunday, the game and the ads have come and gone. Was the U.S.'s biggest sporting event family friendly this year? And Renaissance Art Revisited, an exhibit at the National Gallery of Art gives us a glimpse into life in 15th century Florence. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, February 2nd, 2015. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Brian Patrick looking at your news now. More money for roads, military, education, and child care. That's according to President Obama's newly revealed 2016 budget plan. The proposed increase in next year's budget includes more taxes for the nation's wealthiest Americans. Chief White House correspondent Suzanne LaFranchi has more tonight. Suzanne? Well, Wyatt, the budget battles are heating up. President Obama wants to tax the wealthy and businesses to pay for $74 million more in domestic programs. And as you can imagine, that's sparking pushback among Republicans who now control Congress. Copies of the $4 trillion budget arrived early this morning to Capitol Hill. Obama is calling for higher taxes on the wealthy and corporations to pay for education, public works projects, and child care. Today, the president said his proposal is aimed at helping low- and middle-income families by taxing the wealthy. The budget that Congress now has in its hands is built on those values. It helps working families' paychecks go farther by treating things like paid sick leave and child care as the economic priorities that they are. The proposal offers nearly $300 billion in tax cuts for mainly the middle class. The centerpiece of the president's tax proposal increases the tax rate on couples earning over $500,000 from 23.8% to 28%. Obama is also calling on an increase in inheritance taxes and imposing a tax on 100 financial companies worth more than $50 billion. The billions generated from those tax increases translate into tax breaks for the middle class, including up to a $500 tax credit and a boost in a child care tax credit, up to $3,000 per child. Money for education is also included. The White House is also calling for a $38 billion increase for the Pentagon. It supports our troops and strengthens our border security. And it gives us the resources to confront global challenges from ISIL to Russian aggression. Republicans insist they are the true supporters of the middle class, not Obama or Democrats. Expanding opportunity, protecting middle class savings, holding government accountable. These are your priorities. House Speaker John Boehner says the Obama budget is advocating more spending, more taxes and more debt. The GOP wants to focus on revamping the tax code and is expected to introduce a budget of its own before April 15th. Expect a long, drawn-out battle. Wyatt. Suzanne LaFranchi at the White House, thanks very much. James Capretta is a former associate director for the White House Office of Management and Budget. He's also a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. So, Jim, you've looked at the president's budget. He says he's raising taxes in order to help working families. But what has gone to the, into the budget? What do you think really is a reflection of the values in this budget? Well, there's certainly a debate underway right now between the president and his party and the Republicans in Congress about how to help the middle class and lower class get better job opportunities. The president wants to raise a lot more revenue and spend it on a lot more federal programs, including some things like training and infrastructure. Republicans are trying to emphasize more the private economy, how to grow jobs in the private sector, business growth, et cetera. And so there's a, a debate, what's going to work better to actually promote growth in the country, especially for people that have been struggling for the last decade or so, really longer, 20 years, with stagnant wages. And like we've been seeing, a lot of those programs are domestic oriented. What do you think is the motivation for the president in trying to expand the domestic government program specifically? Well, in some ways, I think the president's trying to frame up a debate about the 2016 presidential election. A lot of people have already said, and I think rightly so, that some of these ideas aren't likely to make it through the most Republican Congress in a long, long time, decades. So he's proposing a lot more governmental activism at a time when a Congress is probably unlikely to take him up and pass them. So really, I think what he's doing is trying to frame up an argument for a political debate that goes into the 2016 presidential race about what will promote growth and prosperity going forward. He's trying to protect his legacy and move the country more in his direction. Okay, and there, there certainly is a lot in this budget. Are there any red flags for Catholics, especially as you look at that in terms of Catholic values? 
Well, there's uh, there's always, as part of these, this president's budget, things that we would find objectionable. There are things like funding for family planning through uh, Planned Parenthood through the family planning programs. There's funding for abortion overseas. There's funding for, of course, through the health care program, abortion and required contraceptive services in health insurance plans, including those offered by Catholic employers. So there's lots of things that violate our sense of what's right and wrong in that area. But on the other hand, of course, there's lots of programs that Catholics that are worried about uh, the poor and, and access for uh, immigrants and others to needed social services, they do expand many of those things in this budget, which I think a lot of Catholics would find uh, favorable. One last thing, do you think this budget provides any opportunities to work with Republicans? The president has is, is proposed a, a defense spending increase. I think the defense budget is where, one place where the Republicans and Democrats both agree it's gone too low. Uh, there's a lot of threats in the world today. The, the budget now is going down to levels we haven't seen really since prior to World War II. So it's a very, very slow, low uh, federal budget for defense, and both parties want to undo that. I think also in infrastructure, building roads and bridges and our airports, there could be some agreement around that. Okay, well, we'll be watching to see how this plays out. Certainly a lot of politics that will be talked about throughout the rest of this year. James Capretta, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Now to some of our other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. A snowstorm is barreling through the U.S., canceling thousands of flights and closing many schools. Parts of the Northeast are expected to get as much as 16 inches of snow. Public officials are announcing parking bans so crews can keep the roads clear. The new snowstorm means delays in some high-profile Boston trials. Jury selection is postponed in both the Boston Marathon bombing trial and former New England Patriots star Aaron Hernandez murder trial. The storm hit the Midwest this weekend. In Chicago, more than 19 inches of snow fell at O'Hare Airport, bringing traffic to a halt. This makes it the fifth largest snowstorm in the city's history. And if Poxitani Phil is correct on this Groundhog's Day, be prepared for winter to linger for another six weeks. In spite of today's storm, Phil saw his shadow when he emerged from his burrow. Japan is stepping up security across the country this week. That after video surfaced supposedly showing a second Japanese hostage beheaded by the Islamic State. The news has left many in Japan shocked and saddened. Dozens of people gathered in Tokyo today for an interfaith prayer vigil dedicated to the two Japanese hostages. Christians, Buddhists, and Muslims prayed outside of the prime minister's office. We are sharing the same feelings. We are so sad. We lost two, two good Japanese people. We feel support, as you can see here, you know. We get together and we pray together for the peace. It's a similar sentiment across the country as Japanese are learning more about the death of Kinji Goto, a 47-year-old freelance reporter being held hostage by extremists. The video released Saturday appears to show the result of the beheading of Goto. The ISIS terrorists blame Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for taking part in an unwinnable war. Abe responded today vowing to protect his country and fight terrorism. We are not going to forgive these horrendous and despicable terrorists. To make them make up for their sins for sure, Japan will work with international community. Threats from the Islamic State group have prompted tighter security at airports and at Japanese facilities overseas, such as embassies and schools. The failure to save Goto raises concern for the life of a Jordanian fighter pilot also held by the militant group. The latest video did not mention the pilot. Goto's mother said Sunday that her son's death is heartbreaking. I have nothing now but tears sweeping to my eyes. I keenly wish that we will carry on Kenji's will to save the lives of children from war and poverty. In a spirit of tolerance, a four-year-old tweet from Goto has gone viral, serving as an online memorial. In the tweet, Goto says, closing my eyes and holding still. It's the end if I get mad or scream. It's close to a prayer. Hate is not for humans. Judgment lies with God. That's what I learned from my Arabic brothers and sisters. Today, the U.S. government offered its support for Japan in the wake of Goto's death. Japan is not involved in the military campaign against ISIS, but Japan has been providing humanitarian aid in the Middle East. An Egyptian court sentences 183 people to death today over an assault on a police station after the ousting of President Mohamed Morsi. Fifteen police officers died in the attack. The assault was believed to be revenge by Morsi loyalists for the government's crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood. Morsi was ousted by the military in 2013 following mass protests against his rule. Today's verdict is the latest in a string of mass death sentences sparking local and international condemnation. 
Eight people were killed in eastern Ukraine Sunday as fighting continues between Ukrainian government and pro-Russian separatist forces. The city of Donetsk has come under heavy shelling. Several buildings and cars were damaged over the weekend, but explosions could still be heard throughout the city today. The conflict in eastern Ukraine has killed more than 5,100 people since April. Meanwhile, Germany says it will not provide weapons to the Ukrainian government during this crisis. Chancellor Angela Merkel told journalists that the conflict cannot be solved militarily. Merkel says she prefers economic sanctions on Russia and negotiations to solve the ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine. Pope Francis plans to visit Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina, in June. Sabato 6 giugno, addio piacendo. The surprise announcement came during yesterday's Angelus address in St. Peter's Square. Francis hopes the one-day trip will encourage Bosnia's Catholic population to support brotherhood within the country. The former Yugoslavian nation was ravaged by war in the early 1990s, which took more than 100,000 lives. Thousands of people, including Muslim Bosnians and Catholic Croats, were killed or taken to concentration camps before or during Serb efforts to drive out non-Serbs. Four American bishops have been elected to represent the U.S. at this year's Synod on the Family in Rome. The delegates are Archbishop Joseph Kurtz from Louisville. He's also the president of the U.S. Bishops Conference, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo from Galveston, Houston, and the vice president of the U.S. Bishops Conference, Archbishop Charles Chaput from Philadelphia, where the World Meeting of Families will be held, and Archbishop Jose Gomez of Los Angeles, the largest U.S. archdiocese. The Vatican has also confirmed two alternate participants, Archbishop Blaise Supic from Chicago. He was Pope Francis' first major U.S. appointment, and Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione from San Francisco. The Synod on the Family will be held in October. The meeting of church leaders from around the world will focus on issues facing the family today. And today we mark the World Day for Consecrated Life, started by St. John Paul II. This celebration comes on the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord. Tonight, Alan Holdren shows us how a few sisters who have given their life to God are serving the church. In Rome's historic center, sheltered from the bustle of the city, a small group of sisters dedicate themselves to work and study. They are Dominicans from the U.S. and Canada, invited over in 2013 by the head of the city's North American Seminary to manage its libraries. He got what he wanted, <laughs> which was a couple of sisters who were very willing to take care of the library and, um, and to be a witness for the seminarians and the priests who live and work here. There's four of us sisters who are here, um, and we live together, and we have a small convent um, on the grounds. And two of the sisters are librarians, and then another sister and I study at the Angelicum, um, the Pontifical University of St. Thomas. They are teachers by training, striving to bring others to holiness through education and Eucharistic adoration. And based on their community's recent growth, their way of life is appealing to other young women. Founded by just four sisters like them 18 years ago, now they number 110, with an average age of 30. This is against the trend in the United States, where according to Georgetown University's Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, there are 70% fewer women religious today than there were 50 years ago. Vocation's a mystery. Part of it is a little mysterious, you know, when two people get married, well, why that person, you know, exactly. Um, it is, you know, kind of a falling in love. And as you live your life, maybe you look back and you kind of see how the pieces all fall together. Comfortable in their vocations, they're celebrating Pope Francis' year of consecrated life this year in the center of the church. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EWTN News Nightly. Coming up. Super Bowl Sunday is over, but was it family friendly this year? We'll tell you how the mega sporting event scored. And the Vatican focuses on women and their perspective on faith and society this week. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Millions watched last night as the New England Patriots beat the Seattle Seahawks in Super Bowl 49. The final numbers aren't in yet to be tallied, but last night's game may have scored the largest TV ratings of all time. Our Jason Calvey joins us now with more. Jason. Wyatt, about 50% of homes in the largest TV markets were tuned in last night. We're still waiting for the numbers for the rest of the regions. What we do know is many millions caught the Super Bowl and the commercials. We won! The 2015 Super Bowl champions, the New England Patriots. Their 28-24 win over Seattle was a close call, 
cornerback Malcolm Butler made an interception with 20 seconds left in the game. They got the best out of me, and it's just a blessing and a dream come true. Quarterback Tom Brady won his fourth Super Bowl and was the game's most valuable player. You know, coach grinds us pretty hard every day, and the expectations are high every day. You know, you just can't go out there and run around and break a sweat and think that you're doing anything. You got to get the, the work done and you got to do it the right way. But another all star of the night was dad, featured in several commercials, including one from Toyota. Being a dad is more than being a father, it's a commitment, one that will make a wonderful human being. And this Dove commercial. Dad. Not all the ads were so clean, but the Parents Television Council says it's always been a mixed bag. Some companies that historically have kind of taken the low road with their advertising, like GoDaddy, uh, they've cleaned up their act this year and last year. When I wake up. Melissa Henson says companies can benefit from keeping their Super Bowl ads family friendly. The Association of National Advertisers uh, several years ago uh, did some research and they found that um, ads with a positive message, ads that air in a family friendly context can do a lot to build brand equity. That is, people trust the brand more, they're more likely to think highly of the brand. So let us know what your favorite ad was. Connect with EWTN News Nightly on Facebook and on Twitter. Wyatt? Jason Calvey, thanks very much. Doug Eldridge is a public relations expert and the managing partner of the DLE agency, a firm that works with professional athletes. So Doug, when you were watching this game, what kind of tone did the NFL strike last night, both with the commercials and the halftime show? I think that's probably the best descriptive because what we're really talking about is the juxtaposition of partying with parenting partying with priorities. Now, in the context of a halftime show, you want it to be festive. You want it to be energetic. You want people to stand up and dance and sing and say, I love that song. You certainly do with Katy Perry. Right, exactly. Right. But I think the decided departure was really in the tone of the commercials. And, and your last segment teased that. It was, it was a d demonstrable and deliberate shift toward priorities, toward circling the wagons and really focusing on the family unit, which was, which was very unique. Of the 61 commercials, give or take a couple, across the, the, the commercial spectrum, uh, you know, 12 were automotive, then you went down eight to movies, six to food, et cetera. But regardless of the category, the point of commonality across all of them was the tone and temperament. So what's the strategy behind doing that, or well, if there is one? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I, I think to some degree it was a little bit of dumb luck. But you also have to remember it's deliberate pre-polling, right? Okay. All of these advertisers and their associated agencies did their due diligence and found that this year there, was, there should be a marked departure from shtick and comedy, et cetera. Instead, mm -hmm. let's focus on the family unit. And obviously, all the polling numbers came back similar because we saw such commonality across the advertising message. And this comes as, of course, uh, the NFL is dealing with its own scandals. You know, we turn and we think about the Ray Rice scandal and the issue of domestic abuse. How did the league respond first off this year and uh, this past year, and what does it mean moving forward? Well, I, I think you're looking at, at two different games, right? You were looking at the present and we're looking at the future. And I think what that ultimately boils down to is the corporate conference room table versus the kitchen room table. Mm -hmm. And here's what I mean by that. From a current standpoint, the investment from corporate America in the National Football League has been unfazed, right? We saw, we saw advertising rates go for a record $4.5 million for a 30-second spot. This was the highest, most expensive ticket in NFL Super Bowl history. We also heard that they smashed the Nielsen numbers, okay? So from an investment standpoint, from a corporate standpoint, from the conference room table standpoint, the NFL is unfazed in the short term. Now the catch and the caveat comes in the long term, and that's the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. Now the kitchen table is the heartbeat of every American home. That's where victories are celebrated, defeats are memorialized, and lessons are learned. And the narrative and the conversation throughout American homes at the kitchen table has been what type of messaging, mentoring, and leadership role have the, have the athletes in the National Football League, let alone the brass of the National Football League, been setting? And do we want our children to be participating? And that's really going to be the impact. It's not something that's going to be felt in the short term. The Nielsen's indicate it. The ad revenues indicate it. The sponsorship buy-ins. It's going to be the long-term effect. Yeah, absolutely, and certainly something that NFL fans are going to be watching to see how they address it as well. Uh, Doug, thanks so much for joining us. Doug Eldridge. Thank you for having me.
And the Super Bowl champions are heading home after their victory over the Seattle Seahawks. A parade will kick off in downtown Boston tomorrow so that local fans can celebrate the Patriots' fourth Super Bowl title. The traditional post-parade rally at City Hall won't be happening, though, as Boston continues to clear more than three feet of accumulated snow. To Rome now as Vatican is hosting a conference this week on the life of women. Officials say it's part of an effort to reach out to women and address their concerns. We have to represent not just the European or traditional sentiment, but also that of other cultures and other horizons. Cardinal Ravazzi told reporters highlighting women doesn't imply division from men. It helps to better understand women's perspective on the world. Up next, Pope Francis defends life from conception to natural death, and a window into the world of an Italian Renaissance artist whose works inspire us to this day. Thank you for joining us this evening for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Pope Francis is encouraging Italians to foster a culture of life. Cuando ci si apre a la vita e si serve la vita, si sperimenta la forza rivoluzionaria dell'amore e della tenerezza. The Holy Father saying, when you're open to life, you feel the revolutionary force of love and tenderness. His comments came on Italy's Day for Life yesterday. It's an initiative promoted by the Italian bishops. Pope Francis joined the bishops in calling for the recognition of the human person from conception to natural death. In the spirit of St. Francis, the Holy Father is encouraging farmers to love the land as Mother Earth. Along with their families, members of Italy's National Federation of Farmers met with the Pope in Rome. Francis told them that the global food production and distribution should be radically rethought. He also talked about man's call to both cultivate and preserve the land. For their part, the guests gave the Pope a basket of goodies, including some vegetables. A new exhibition at the National Gallery of Art in Washington explores the works of an Italian master of the Renaissance. His paintings give a glimpse into life in the 15th century Florence. Susie Pinto takes us inside the exhibit. When you enter the world of artist Piero di Cosimo, you enter the world of Renaissance Italy with its religion, myths, allegory, and pagan symbolism. The 15th century Italian painter has been neglected for several hundred years, until now. A new show at the National Gallery of Art showcases Piero's work. On the one hand, he's full of the unexpected and uh, the fantastic, um, the improbable. Uh, on the other hand, he also speaks a very human language, uh, one that one could ex uh, describe best as a visual vernacular. Piero was popular in his day and painted for many of the richest families in Florence. He wasn't so much an innovator of technique, but a master of techniques for creating stories in paint. This painting, The Visitation with St. Nicholas and St. Anthony Abbott, is a gem in the exhibition. Piero invites you into the panel. He leads the eye of the worshiper, of the spectator, throughout the picture. So you see many more scenes than just the primary scene. On the canvas, Piero painted a nativity scene behind Mary's shoulder. And on the other side of the painting, he added a depiction of the massacre of the innocents under orders from King Herod. Another genre is Piero's paintings of mythology. This painting shows the rescue of Andromeda, a king's daughter about to be sacrificed to save the kingdom. In swoops Perseus to save her and slay the sea monster. One thing is certain uh, that he had a very um, active and wonderfully strange sense of fantasy. Piero's work is filled with humor and whimsy, as well as serious lessons for both the sacred and the secular. The exhibition runs through early May. In Washington, Susie Pinto, EWTN News Nightly. Always interesting to see the influence of the church in painting. Susie, thanks very much. Well, that wraps up our newscast tonight. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and watch again anytime on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Thanks for watching. We leave you tonight with pictures of Pope Francis celebrating Mass on the Feast of the Presentation of the Lord in St. Peter's Basilica. Good night, and God bless.